Hello everybody, hi everybody. How are you? We are waiting for Marina Castillo de Val to join to our live. We are joining. Hello, Mariana is connecting from Berlin where she's based. Thank you for joining everybody. So we're very glad. I think this is the fifth uh, edition of uh, our live series in the studio in which we're in dialogue with artists that are talking to us from the houses, the studios or whatever they're doing the quarantine. And uh, they're sharing with us some uh, ideas about the practice one second, let's see if Mariana, Mariana, I'm going to try again, re-invite you. Mm -hmm. Go live with Mariana. Hello, I see you. Hi, Stan. Hola. Hello. Hi, Hi Mariana, <laughs> how are you? Good, Thank and you? you. Good, thank you for being with us. Uh, I was, uh, people are showing in on the live, on the chat, and anybody who has any question, you can write it down there. We're going to be talking with Mariana, talking about um, her recent practice and, and her life. And I don't know if you want to start by sharing with us a little bit of how is your life in the quarantine in Berlin. <laughs> uh, yeah, we're, we're here at home. Uh, we returned from some travel, so we needed to stay here for two weeks. Um, yeah. A lot of reading, cooking, fixing bookshelves, sanding, and I don't know. I'm very happy to be able to do this with you tonight. Absolutely. <laughs> fixing bookshelves is something that I think we've all been doing and nobody's commenting so much on. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel like it's a typical quarantine activity. Um, but anyway, um, so... Um, you thought specifically about a series of works that you wanted to share with us. I'm going to be sharing some of the works that Mariana will be telling us, if that is okay. So we're going to start with some... One second. Hello. So I don't know if you want to tell us something about this. Ah, uh, yeah. I wanted to talk, uh, start with that. Well, I was uh, today at the studio and I was sanding a lot. I mean, this is a technique that I have been using for some years. It's called scagliola. It's an Italian technique that somehow tries to imitate uh, stones and other natural materials. Uh, I don't know if you see it, but it's somehow the Mexico. And on the left side, this is something that looks like Africa. So it's a bit like Google Maps uh -huh. or something like this. But uh -huh. it was totally accidental. So I don't know what happened with this, but somehow it was a good activity to be just uh, doing a very monotonous and manual labor for about mm -hmm. five hours until this image appeared. And mm -hmm. well, it's a lot about uh, colors and labor. And when we started uh, talking mm -hmm. about the possibility of doing this conversation, we were also talking about other moments in history where this, there has been a pandemic. People have been endangered by a certain disease and they have been also recluded and trying to do something with their lives and trying to fight with these extraordinary circumstances and uh, well in Mexico this this year happens to be also the 500th anniversary of uh, the conquest of Mexico where there was also a major pandemic that was um, it was because the Spaniards uh, brought a lot of diseases that uh, the Mexican, the indigenous population, they didn't have any antibodies against it, more or less what it's happening to many people right now. It was much more severe. There was uh, smallpox, there was also influenza. And at one point, about 80% of the population uh, died. And it was around this time when... Um, one uh, Franciscan monk, uh, Bernardino de Sagaún, he started to compile this uh, book, which is called the Florentine Codex. Uh, it's called the Florentine Codex because it's now in Florence, 
it ended up there and that's why it was not destroyed. It was, uh, it's a colonial document, so it means that it was made after the conquest, but many of the people who contribute to the construction, to the writing of this, of this work were indigenous uh, people who had a lot of knowledge. So Bernardino de Sagaún, he basically wanted to compile in one volume all the knowledge about indigenous people in Mexico. So the plants, the animals, the way of doing things, the religion. And uh, the book had, I don't know, about 2,000 pages and there were 12 different volumes and each volume was dedicated to one specific topic. Uh, they were also recluded in one uh, convent, which was called the Tratelolco convent. And it's where the whole book was uh, painted and, and drawn. It had always two columns, as you can see on the image on top. So there was one column was in Spanish and the other one was in Nahuatl, which is one of the indigenous uh, languages, the one that was more widely spoken by the Mexica community and uh, and then it had also a lot of illustrations as you can see on the left side there is uh, one of these illustrations at the beginning when the document started to be studied uh, a lot of people were paying more attention to the text so not so many people were actually studying the document itself and um, so all this uh, started because in 2000 18, I did a project with Diana Magaloni and also with Tatiana Falcon that ended up in an exhibition at the Amparo Museum that was called Intlili Intlapali, which means the black and the colors in Nahuatl. And it was basically a kind of uh, research on the origins of this document and also in the extensive research that Diana Magaloni and Tatiana Falcon did around the fabrication and the composition of the pigments and the tinctures that were used to make these drawings. So, for example, in the image that you see now, that many of the drawings, uh, I converted them also into mural paintings in the exhibition. This is mm -hmm. a very specific image where one of the main, uh, well, two of the main kings are being uh, killed. One is already been thrown to the river and the other one is about to be thrown. And for example, when they studied the chemical composition of this drawing, they realized that all the tinctures were uh, originally from Mexico and there was just the vest and the hat of the Spaniard who is throwing this king into the water. And this mm -hmm. was the only one that was a, a Spanish or a European pigment. It was cadmium. So there were a lot of secrets in the way these drawings were painted, not just the obvious iconography, but also the actual composition of the, mm -hmm. of the colors. So this is something that I thought it was uh, fascinating. So if you go to the next image, uh, sure. ah, yeah, this is just a close-up of, uh -huh. of the wall drawing. What was also beautiful is that uh, together with Tatiana Falcon, we made all the pigments. So all the murals were also painted with the original tinctures or pigments. So, exactly. So a lot of the tinctures that were used are uh, coming from plants because plants are closer to the sky. So they, are, they were considered more sacred or more holy. And mm -hmm. on the opposite, the pigments, which are from a mineral origin, they relate us more to the earth. So there's also like a decision in the way the colors are being used, depending on, their, mm -hmm. on the relationship they have to the landscape or to nature and so on. Um, yeah, this was, for example, the first rainbow that was painted in Mexico because nobody thought that rainbows would look like that. So also <laughs> the indigenous painters, they also received a lot of images from Europe and then the priests, they were telling them, yeah, this is a rainbow. And they were like, oh, okay, we would never paint it like that. But <laughs> so this, uh, this rainbow, also the colors are not organized in the way we normally organize rainbows, but mm -hmm. they somehow 
uh, did the first attempt to do it. Mm -hmm. And in the next image, there was uh, also the same rainbow that I painted on the exhibition. Also, what you see on the vitrines were a lot of original documents that were brought from the National Archives in Mexico. They're also mm -hmm. colonial documents, but they were painted still by indigenous painters. So also this project was important because we were trying to make an emphasis that at the moment of the conquest, it's not like all the indigenous population and the indigenous knowledge disappeared. It was a continuation and it was a transformation mm -hmm. of that knowledge into other things. And so, uh, just, just to guide the audience just a little bit, you want to tell us where and when this show happened? This is in Amparo? Yeah, it was Puebla. at the Museo Amparo in Puebla, which is a city in Mexico. And mm -hmm. Puebla, it's also a state. Uh, it's a, a Puebla in specific, it's called also Puebla de Los Angeles. It's one of the cities with more churches, I think, in the whole world. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so also this mixture of the of the two different cultures is very strong when you go there to the convents mm -hmm. and to the churches. You can really see how these two knowledges were somehow integrated. And the Amparo Museum is a contemporary art museum, but they also have a pre-Columbian uh, collection. So they are always mm -hmm. making links between these uh, different things. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, in the next image, there is something. Uh, this was another room. Uh, I this think is another the, angle of this. this is, uh, uh, ah, yeah, and this one. Uh -huh. So the, this uh, story, I like it a lot. There is uh, one of the last books of the Florentine Codex. Uh, it's the 11th book. It's called the Book of the Colors and the Painters. Uh, and it basically shows all the different techniques of how to extract the colors from the earth or from the plants, how to process them and so on. And in the text, sometimes it also has recipes of how to do it. Uh, but something happened in this book. It's one of the last books. So because of the pandemic and the, they didn't have any more resources and no more colors either, this book mm -hmm. about colors is completely in black and white. So you, need to, <laughs> so you need to imagine the colors. Uh, so because if you see what uh, the different characters are doing, then you can recognize which color it is. For example, on the left, you see that it's the cactus. So they're extracting the cochinillas to make the carmine red. And some of them we don't know because it's very difficult also. Uh, to recognize. So what I did in this mural, in the other images, there are other, other views. So it was one room that was completely full with all these uh, small illustrations, but I kind of put them together into one scene. So I made like one landscape out of all these different uh, drawings. And this was also painted on the walls with the with the pigments, in this case, it was with the black, with the tlili, which is a mineral pigment. Mm -hmm. And um, it was also important to, to work with the murals because uh, it's also known that many of these paintings were also thrown into the walls of the temples and the houses, but many of these mural paintings disappeared. And I also thought it was a a kind of an act of resistance because in Mexico we have so many male muralists and it was, yes. I don't know, I also felt uh, always strange as a woman to, to do a mural, so it was also like and the person that you see there on the top left because sometimes uh, Diana Magaloni when she wrote her essay about the Florentine Codex, uh, specifically about this book she recognizes 12 uh, painters because of the style of the different illustrations. Because Bernardino de Sagaún, who is the one who compiled all the volumes, mm -hmm. he's the one who is known to be the author of this book. He, but he was just the compiler or the editor. But all the mm -hmm. painters, the indigenous painters, of course, they are not being credited. But now at least they are being recognized. So they are like, mm -hmm. there is one that it's known because he makes very nice noses. Another <laughs> one is very good. Uh, 
he's the master of both worlds so he can make like a european illustration but also an indigenous illustration mm -hmm. there is another one who is the master of skin colors so in this there was a small joke so i painted myself on the left top side <laughs> that is amazing <laughs> i think that is an amazing gesture also because it's what a lot of muralists did in their own murals right um, i don't know it's just i know you know joke. something i really like uh, about this project which i think is fantastic is um and it has to do with what you mentioned about this idea of doing a contemporary mural you know is I think it's fantastic because it talks a lot about like the contemporary uh, thrive towards the archive. You're making a super contemporary, super critical mural, which is like the device of Mexican art. But instead of like doing it, uh, just thinking about the future, it's, it's an act of future what you're doing, right? Because you, you're criticizing the immediate past of the Mexican muralism, but by recuperating the, the real past of muralism, which is these indigenous practices that had been left to the side. So I think there's this play with these two ideas of like past, like almost like, you know, like like almost like pretirito perfecto, pretirito perfecto, simply like, like the different ideas of like the past tense, you know? Anyway, so um, I wanted to, before we keep going, I wanted to share a question from people. I mean, one comment by Camilo Godoy, like he's saying like how Renaissance artists often paint themselves in their work, um, which is something we just mentioned, but also Hans Baumann, uh, is asking if there are maps in the Florentine Codex, and if you can speak a little bit about the role of maps and mapping in your practice. Mm, yeah, I have been working a lot uh, on maps and also indigenous maps. Uh, specifically, the Florentine Codex, it doesn't have a, a big section about cartography, but we included a lot of maps in the exhibition. And they were mainly uh, indigenous maps that were Uh, land claims. So because the Spanish uh, authorities, they were kind of uh, trying to reorganize uh, people who were living in certain communities, so they were segregating people and all the rights of land, of water were being destroyed. So what the indigenous people were doing was to rewrite their own history and present it as a document to claim the rights of certain Uh, regions of also lineages of people that would prove that they were belonging to that to that specific mm -hmm. land. So that was something actually very, very important. And um, yeah, I've been also interested in the way these different ways of representation uh, collided at this time in history. So there were like different ways of uh, approaching a space. And this is something that probably will come back when we talk about the garden that I did also as part of the mm -hmm. exhibition. Uh, but also coming back to what you were saying about history, another of the main questions that we were asking Uh, Diana Magaloni was talking about uh, to whom does uh, the past belong? This was one of the main questions of the show. Mm -hmm. And also, for instance, we as Mexicans, we don't have access to the actual Fl Florentine Codex because it's in Europe. And many of these uh, documents are not in Mexico because they kind of left the country at mm -hmm. a certain point. So we just have access to facsimiles, to copies, to images on the internet. And that's why we also took the license, let's say the creative license to reproduce them. So some mm -hmm. of them are digital prints or murals or drawings. So it's a kind of uh, promiscuous appropriation of the past where we are not pretending to have the original, but it's more like a kind of, uh, I don't know, redigestion of of our own past in order to to make it ours again i would say <laughs> yeah i think that the past can never be approached in a clean way and i think that i mean it's a super important political gesture you're making um so i mean somebody's also saying tell us about the wooded map in the new museum but Uh, well, we're going to see another map in a second. Should I keep going with the slides, Mariana? Meanwhile? Yeah, you can keep going and then we will arrive to... Uh, mm -hmm. This one, for example, there were mm -hmm. uh, some tables where there were also the original pigments, the materials that were used mm -hmm. to make the, the paintings and the murals. Um, 
This was I also love... coming from, it looks a bit like a comal. It's what we use in Mexico to heat the tortillas. So uh -huh. it had also like a kind of uh, very much mm -hmm. reference. Yeah. <laughs> That is fantastic. I love it also um, about this type of installation and an online combination of murals with like these devices that they refer a lot also to the type of museographic devices that we're so used to see, you know, and um, the fact that you're using them in an art exhibition, this um, I, I, I really like because it's also like, like this, like uh, you're breaking the boundaries of the division in between like an historical museum or like these like uh, didactic devices and what is considered the true artistic object or, or you know, or historical, um, uh, the, you know, artifact. And I think that's super interesting because it also offers a more um, approachable access to the art object that goes beyond, you know, this like imitation of like the thing that you have the real thing inside of the train and then you have, you know, the, uh, the explanation in your case, the art is the explanation, if you know what I mean. And I love yeah, how yeah. you appropriate these like museographic devices uh, to make them the art themselves. Yeah, mm. it was also an experiment. On, it was not a mm -hmm. cryptic exhibition. It was trying to be understandable in many different levels. So I was also uh -huh. in many moments trying to forget that I was a contemporary artist and that things should speak for themselves. Uh, in this case, they cannot speak for themselves. So there was, there was more like, mm -hmm. support. It was like creating the museography and the whole navigation. Well, but at the same time, maybe they are speaking more for themselves precisely because you are speaking about them, right? There's a more honest thing about like the, the, the honesty of saying that we're always telling a, a story of these objects. And, you know, there's no like, like real honest truth of these objects. And I feel like when we are historians or anthropologists try to tell the story of a certain artifact, we're always putting in like this idea of true behind and this idea of research. And I feel like artists have a more like free approach that can even become a better and more honest approach. That's why, you know, there's a lot of discussions lately about exhibitions curated by artists and how they're much better than the ones that we curate. <laughs> and they love it and it's true, no. you know. <laughs> Uh, well, I mean, I guess it depends. It depends on the artist and the curator, of course. But there, there is certainly like a freedom in the approach that an artist can bring to the curatorial practice. You know, like like um, like a non-ceremonial approach to the object. You know, um, and yeah, but also I consider this as a collaboration. So I really did it together with with Diana and with Tatiana. And myself. That's great. So there was like mm -hmm. some, like we were also discussing a lot how to do it. That's and great. So on. Yeah. And anyway, then sorry, in the next pictures, well, this one you can also already skip it. It's more or less of uh -huh. the same kind of tables. These are some views of the other exhibitions. And this one, um, that one, you can what? go to the one before. Yeah, this, this one? one. Yeah. Uh, this is a very important image. It doesn't come from the Florentine Codex. It's from another codex. Uh, it's called the Ferre Yari Maya. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, but this image appears in many other documents. It's basically a calendar. It's called mm -hmm. the Tonal Poguali. And it was like the, it's a calendar that was shared by many different cultures in Mesoamerica. Mm -hmm. And it had a year that consisted of 260 days. And uh, so there were like segments of 20 signs and there were like 13 numbers. So if you see like it makes like a drawing, it's like a kind of geometrical drawing. So if you count mm -hmm. all these segments, you will arrive to the number of 260. And the different days are also related to the space. So if it's one is related to the east, to the west, also to the winter, to the summer, to the spring. It also has to do with agriculture. So it's a very important image because it kind of collides a space and time in one mm -hmm. single representation. So uh, we took this image as a base uh, to do a garden that you can see in the next image is uh, the diagram of a uh, of how it was organized. There it's, it's just like a very simple drawing, but 
we wanted to organize also all the different uh, plants and minerals that mm -hmm. were used to, to paint uh, documents in organized in this uh, calendar. So for example, there is one area that were just all the plants and pigments that are used to make reds, like the cochinilla and the palo de campeche. And another one were all the blues with the indigo and the palo de Brazil. Then there were some amates, which are the trees that are made to make paper. And there was also another section on the left for all the oranges where it's like the Zacatlascali, which is a parasite plant, and also the Sempasuchitl, this very uh, famous flower that is also used a lot on uh, Death's Day. Uh, mm -hmm. So when you go to the next image, then you see more or less how the garden wow. looked from the top. Mm -hmm. uh, it was in one of the courtyards of the museum. It's a colonial building, so in the center there is a there is a fountain that I camouflaged and converted it into a sort of pyramid <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> to change a bit the, the significance of the space. And people mm -hmm. could like walk around. And mm -hmm. if you go to the next images, then you see some of the close-ups of uh, how mm -hmm. the, the plants started to grow. Those are all the blues. I mean, of course, you don't see blue when the plant is growing, but you need to... Mm -hmm. You need to go through a lot of different processes in order to extract the pigment and fix it and so on. But those are some of the of the images. And on the top of the center pyramid, there was just like a water mirror so people could walk around and stay there. Mm -hmm. And stay there like for three months. I mean, the duration of the exhibition. Afterwards, we donated all the different... Uh, plants to a ethnobotanical garden in the state of uh, Morelos in Mexico. So, so all great. these plants are still there. Yeah, it was also really special because some of these plants come from the mountains and other ones come from very dry places. So it was mm -hmm. also a kind of Borges fiction because this garden cannot really <laughs> exist as such for a very long time. Yeah, um, very gorgeous, and also as an encyclopedia of colors, right? Like, like, like a bestiario of like the plants. <laughs> exactly. Like, or, for example, yeah. these amate trees. Eventually, mm -hmm. they grow gigantic, so they would not mm -hmm. fit anymore into this garden. So it I was really a like also, momentary fiction. <laughs> yeah, I really like also that um, in. In, in general, when artists, contemporary artists work with plants, they get very nice plants that are already very grown to the perfect size by, you know, by a bond and it is, and they just put it in a museum. I like that here, it like kind of like started from the beginning, you know? I think there's something talking about the whole process um, um, that is conceptually very interesting. Mm. So should I keep going? Yeah, you can keep going. The ones that you see on the back, it's, uh, this mm -hmm. is where the, where the nopales are, then that's where the cochinilla comes. The cochinilla, it's an insect that attaches itself to the nopal cactus. Mm -hmm. And from there, they make this uh, carmine red. That was also mm -hmm. a huge industry in Mexico. Up until now, it's been used as a natural color yes. for cosmetics and for fabrics and for many different things. So this was like a kind of uh, trap. So all the small cochinillas fall <laughs> into the other nopal. And then, then we could exchange them for the other ones. <laughs> ah, that's the reason for the format I see now, yeah. Exactly, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this was the garden. Mm -hmm. This is the whole story about the garden. And then these are just uh, close-ups of the different minerals. Some of them are it's used really to gorgeous. fix the colors mm -hmm. into the different, I don't know, into mm -hmm. fabric or into paper or whatever you need to do it. Because if you just use the pigment on itself or the tincture on itself, mm -hmm. it, many times it just disappears. So you need a lot of things to to make it stay. Mm -hmm. And this was the last work that was uh, exhibited on the 
entrance of the museum. Uh, mm -hmm. Actually, it was done with the, with the same technique that I showed you at the beginning, the one that I was handing today in the morning, uh -huh. Viola. Uh, this was more like uh, all these uh, dots, they're also related to the calendar that I told you. So it's like a tonal powali, mm -hmm. but gone crazy. So it kind of lost the shape and it's just like playing in the space. And uh, the long sticks that you see on the floor, these are more of the right. images of the... Ah, here you see on the... Here, one. here. Exactly. And there you see the other pieces. Mm -hmm. So they are more like giant crayons and each one has... Giant one, crayons, uh, yeah. Love it. Like, uh, or truncated uh, cylinders. And these are also made with the same technique that you were showing us at the beginning. Yeah, they were made with the same technique and they were also inspired by the tests of color that Diana Magaloni did when she was recreating the color. So they always make these small discs of paper where they put all the tests of the colors. So they are kind mm -hmm. of extruded uh, color samples. Not the same. You see the detail. So maybe we can share people the video of the process we were doing today. After ah, yeah, that's this. true. Mm -hmm. uh, that would be lovely. I'm going to go back to show them some of the circles again. I mean, the quality of the materials is spectacular. I don't know if you get to see it. I know that we are not working with the finest technology, but oh well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this was the one I did today. Uh -huh. This is amazing. And I love that we get to see also what you're doing today. Uh, I feel like the idea of somebody working today is like so precious. <laughs> and like you were saying, like the idea of somebody working with their hands. So I'm going to put play. Is that okay? Yeah. The sound is quite spectacular. Also. Yeah, the sound is a bit too intense. <laughs> so you want to tell people what you're doing? Yeah, so this is like a technique that it's made out of plaster and pigments and uh, natural glues. So you make like kind of those and then you mix it together. And then when it's drying, you need to sand it. So you need to kind of get into the end of the surface and you sand uh -huh. it with, with water and with different qualities of sandpaper. And you need to do that for a long time until you get the quality that you want. I mean, I'm not so obsessive as other people, so some people <laughs> end up sanding it with stones. And Like, for example, in many churches in Italy, you can see a lot of columns and places which are, you think it's marble, but it's actually Scagliola. But it's very satisfying in these times of uh, reclusion and when you're tired of working imagine. with your computer and looking and at this the a test ceiling. That you were Ah, yeah, these are the tests that Diana Magaloni did when they were recreating the recipes of the colors from this book that I told you that has no colors. Uh -huh. They mm -hmm. could actually crack out the recipes from there. Mm -hmm. and so they are like all the mixtures. Well, a lot of the ones you're seeing now is with cochinilla. For example, the cochinilla, if you make it more acid or more basic, the mm -hmm. color changes so you can get more oranges or you can get more purples. Some of them have pulque, I think. So you can mix the mm -hmm. colors with different things. So you, you create a chemical reaction and you change the composition of the color, which is fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> this is amazing. Uh, these um, are, of course, the facsimiles. Don't think that they are the originals. So we have the facsimiles there at the exhibition and also some of the samples. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if someone else has uh, other questions or... Yes, please share with us if you have any more questions. I'm trying to check in the... I mean, somebody asked us and maybe now is a good time to tell about it, about the wooded map that you did for the new museum in relation to the question about maps. I can even uh, yeah. really find it here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that one well, came from a map Mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. called the map of Tesacualco. It's mm -hmm. a map which is originally from Oaxaca. And mm -hmm. uh, 
It is now actually in Texas at the Blanton Library. Mm -hmm. It was recently mm -hmm. exhibited. It's a beautiful map. It's very, very large. And it's mm -hmm. made out of a kind of a pastiche of a lot of uh, sheets of uh, European paper. And it's what mm -hmm. I was saying. It's a combination between the lineage of people who were coming from this place and the geography of the place and all the villages which are around. So it's... So here uh, we have the website. Exactly, there you can see some, uh, some images of the, of the map. But in this case, I converted the map into a floor piece. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I transformed the drawing into different shapes. So I divided it into categories. So the land, the water, the plants, and the characters. Mm -hmm. And each of these things uh, was engraved with a different kind of wood. Mm -hmm. So there were like five different kinds of wood and it was, it was like a kind of puzzle. So we kind of embedded all mm -hmm. the different kinds of wood into this uh, wooden pavement. And mm -hmm. yeah, for me, it's also important that the people can actually walk these maps. So it becomes a physical experience. It was really stunning. I, I remember when I saw the show that it was really uh, kind of like shocking to be walking on the map and kind of like feel like you were you know, occupying the space with your own body. Um, I mean, we take it for granted. And, but anyway. Mm. Yeah, it's something that uh, we kind of miss nowadays as well. Yeah. We are not able to, to walk Here there's a so better, much. here we have a better view. Yeah, there you have a better image. So it's also an abs abstracted image of, they made an abstracted version of the surroundings of the village. And mm -hmm. all around are the different communities. And there's another part where you see all the lineage of people that were uh, the founders of this, of this uh, town. Mm -hmm. And it was also one of these documents that were used to, to claim a certain thing to the colonizers. Mm -hmm. So they will get more water rights or land rights. So it was also a legal document somehow. That's amazing. Mm, these are more views of the exhibition. Mm -hmm. We have here somebody asking if you can tell about the project Fatalismo Magico. Ah, Fatalismo uh, Magico, it's a project I did uh, together with a composer, Carlos Sandoval. It was also mm -hmm. organized by alumnos 47 in Mexico. Mm -hmm. And it was, I don't know, we, it comes also a lot from uh, Latin American literature. Like we speak a lot about mm -hmm. uh, magical realism, but at mm -hmm. these times we can speak more about fatalism or something like this. And it was a project that had to do a lot with storytelling. So this mm -hmm. is the only image that came out of the whole project. It's actually a map. But the mm -hmm. project was more based on audio recordings. And we, we kind of inserted uh, different kinds of activities that were a bit surreal or coming from the magical realism into a town in Milpa Alta in San Lorenzo. Uh, so for example, there was a woman who was booming the streets. That was her real profession. But we mm -hmm. constructed a series of uh, ceramic flutes so she could broom and play the flute at the same time. Wow. <laughs> and then there was another one that was, that was the most successful. It was a tortilla oracle. So it was a woman who was uh, making tortillas and she had her comal and she could read your future through the tortillas. So That's she was amazing. making the tortillas to you and depending if the tortilla was like inflating or not or the position or the color of the tortilla she would read you the future and then you can you could leave with your <laughs> package of 12 tortillas uh, so it was it was also important that there was not a lot of uh, visual documentation it was all recorded and at, at the end we made a vinyl record that was like mm -hmm. the result of all this uh, of all this project mm -hmm. <laughs> A lot of work seems um, to come also from collaborations. Um, 
and and collaborations with people coming from similar or related but not the same discipline um yeah this is something i do most of the time i think i would get bored Mm -hmm. if i would need to work (laughs) on my own constantly (laughs) so i really love to collaborate with other people Mm -hmm. yeah absolutely i don't know if anybody has any other question um, meanwhile, I, I don't know if you want to tell people, like, at least describe, um, is there any project that you're working on now, that you were working on now, that you want to share, that um, maybe something? Oh, Vero, Veronica sent us a question. Vero, can you copy-paste the question again or put it on the question section? Because the chat is happily, we have a lot of questions, but... Uh, uh, but meanwhile, um... well, there were a lot of projects being cancelled now because mm-hmm. of the crisis. I think it's going to be a big challenge also for the cultural field to go through this year because we just need to kind of wait until everything goes back to somehow normal, but nobody knows which kind of normal we will have. Absolutely. So, like the kind of talks like we are having today, like we need to find other strategies to keep on to keep on working uh i'm working i mean i we came up with the title of the show before everything started to happen it's called the imaginary museum and i think this title is cursed because the first time i started organizing the imaginary museum the exhibition got cancelled and then Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) now it's gonna happen in another place but it's still called the imaginary museum and maybe it's always gonna be imaginary But it started to make me think also on what is a museum, like what do we do with all the objects which are there, how do we deal with access, with public, with audiences, Mm -hmm. what's going to happen if everything stays closed forever and it just becomes an imaginary product. Uh, So this is something that is coming a lot in my mind and I realize that it's definitely very important that we go into the museums and we walk around and we see absolutely the objects face to face and the digital world is never going to replace this experience so we need to defend it with all our hearts (laughs) i completely agree with you i also feel like this is also an interesting challenge for us artists and, and museum workers to try to imagine ways to approach the museum in new ways and to make the museum more appealing through distance. And, you know, it's a humbling exercise also in the sense of, you know, this is something museums should have been doing more. I mean, I feel like there's an explosion of digital approaches now that is a little bit heavy handed and we're all doing this, including myself, you know, we're all like doing this like um, explosion of digital media, but at the same time, um, I mean, this, activity we're doing is something that a lot of people that might not be able to come to New York that are living in different places in the Americas in Europe they can see so but hopefully as you said this will be like um you know like a hook to bring people back to to the physicality and, and to, or to make their own practices in whatever they are mm-hmm. um but we got sidetracked with this like philosophical conversations and we do have one missing question by Veronica who is actually a friend of mine and she is actually a scholar in um, colonial art. And she says, Mariana, your work is wonderful. I'm not sure if you have discussed this, but I wanted to um, to know how do you create? Uh, the question is too long, Vero. <laughs> the problems of the internet, like Mariana was saying. How do you confront a colonial work? I mean, better you're going to need to retype the question here in two shorter ones. Yeah, mm. I think maybe it's probably related to what we were saying, to whom does the past belong and how, how yeah. can we find different ways of accessing it. It doesn't matter how, but we just need to make it in an honest mm-hmm. and inclusive way. Mm. It probably has to do with that. Uh, better you can tell us if you want anyway, but um, she says, yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so we read your mind. <laughs> um, I think, I mean, the past belongs to nobody and all of us at the same time, right? I mean, that's kind of like the challenge and how can we like share it? Um, 
Um, I don't know if uh, you want to share anything else. I love this idea of the imaginary museum. Um, maybe I'll have to keep being imaginary forever. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I don't know if anybody else has any other question or if you want to share anything else. No, I think I think that's it for now. But I'm very happy mm -hmm. to have shared this these moments with you. Um, yeah, I hope to see you soon in the real, in the tactile and all of the world. Mm -hmm. I even put yes. perfume for for you today, but you cannot. Yes, smell it. <laughs> isn't this amazing? <laughs> this is like my only excuse to dress up to take out my pajamas. <laughs> I'm happy to have this. I feel like it keeps my mental sanity. <laughs> And, and I mean, and this has been great and a great opportunity to also meet you, even though not in person, but hopefully we'll meet in person soon. Um, anyway, um, many hugs. And thank you, everybody. And thank you, Mariana. That was amazing. Thank you. And for anybody, if you want to see this, because you only catch the last part, this is going to go to our stories and then it's going to be uploaded to our website and our YouTube channel. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Stay safe. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. <laughs>